Uh, we were able to explore Jane Austen's context and style and locate her in a very diffuse way, I, I imagine, uh, between romanticism or not. Uh, it demonstrates once again that sometimes to tag some works into very closed uh, moments, uh, even if it's historical moments, it's practically impossible. Um, in this panel session, we will now explore Jane Austen's cultural legacy. Virginia Woolf, in her book Common Reader, which is a series of critical es es essays on different writers, <coughs> says we get to know Jane Austen through a few personal letters, most of them burnt by Cassandra Austen, and through gossips, and of course, through her literary work. And I may add, uh, through her favorite music also. Uh, however, the name Jane Austen strongly echoes today in the worldwide literary culture and mainly in the European collective imagery. We all know what it means when somebody talks about certain places or situations and call it, it was very Jane Austen-like. And we are not strange to movies adaptations in vogue for these past years, but the common reader or, or the common movie fan is poorly informed sometimes or has little pondered the whys and the hows of Jane Austen's legacy. And this is what we will be doing today and this is why we have uh, these three experts in this panel session. Uh, we will be organized as, as follows. I will now present our panelists, uh, then each one of them will speak for about 20 minutes, and then the, uh, the three of them will have time to, to, to talk between them and with the, with the audience. Um, you may ask the questions also in Spanish if you like, uh, you don't have to ask them all in English. So we will begin with presenting Mr. Richard Jenkins, he is Vice President of the Jane Austen Society and Emeritus Professor of the Classical Tradition at the University of Oxford and the Emeritus Fellow of Lady Margaret Hall. He is author of th 10 books, mostly on classical reception in the 19th century, Latin literature and Roman culture, both but, but including a fine brush and ivory, an appreciation of Jane Austen. Mr. Jenkins will be talking about Jane Austen's social influence and will also be telling us what the Jane Austen Society is about. So you have the word. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and my thanks to the university and the Instituto Schumann for inviting me. I've been asked to talk to you about Jane Austen's family, and so I will do that. Um, and uh, but I will try to indicate through this. You know, some sense of what she puts into her novels and what she leaves out um, and then finally try to connect this up with some things that were said in the first session earlier this morning. So I'll begin by looking at Jane Austen's parental family, the Austens themselves and really until the generation of Jane Austen they were really pretty uninteresting they were tradesmen in Kent, in the southeast of England, uh, for generations, and they seem to have eventually lifted themselves up to being just about gentlemen, just about. Um, but for complicated reasons, the early life of George Austen, the novelist's father, and uh, his sister, Philadelphia, was, co was complicated, and it looked as though they might sink down the social scale again. But uh, George Austen managed to get himself to Oxford University. Um, he was handsome, luckily. He married well. I'll come back to that. Um, he became um, a country priest, parson uh, in Hampshire, and um, had the various um, children of whom uh, Jane was one. His sister, Philadelphia, has a rather interesting career. Um, there she was without money and prospects. And she did what some young women did at that time. She exported herself to India, where there were a lot of Englishmen uh, governing the place and trading, and a shortage of English women. So um, she exported herself to India. She did indeed marry um, a wealthy merchant, um, much older than herself, and had a single daughter. Some people think that this daughter's real father 
was Warren Hastings, the great proconsul, the governor of Bengal himself. He was certainly a patron of the family. There isn't really uh, any evidence, any good evidence, that she was a Warren Hastings' daughter, but it is possible. Um, she was Eliza. She returned to uh, England. She married a minor French aristocrat, the Comte de Fide, and lived in, in France for a few years. Uh, the Comte de Feuillide uh, was guillotined. He lost his head in the terror. She managed to escape with her young son, Hastings Feuillide. Um, Hastings Feuillide was invalid, sickly, uh, and died at the age of about 15, I think. Um, Eliza Feuillide, widowed, then married Henry Austin, Jane's brother, um, before um, dying uh, sadly and painfully of cancer. Now, the interesting about, thing about her, perhaps, is it is such a romantic career. Uh, it encompasses three countries. Um, uh, it, uh, <coughs> there's the excitement of the French Revolution and losing your husband to the guillotine. And um, the, there's the beginning of Northanger Abbey. Jane Austen remarks, uh, uh, ironically, that Catherine Morland was not born to be a heroine. Uh, well, he, Eliza de Feuillide was someone who very much was born to be a heroine. She was also pretty and good-natured, um, um, very pretty to judge by the surviving um, portraits of her. Jane Austen, from her own immediate experience of someone who was her first cousin and then her sister-in-law, could have written about this very romantic heroine. It's, it's, the theme is lying in front of her, and she chooses to um, leave it out. I, if we turn to Jane Austen's mother's family, we have a somewhat different picture. Jane Austen's mother was Cassandra Lee, and the Lees were a much grander family. There was a peerage, a lordship, in the family. Um, and the Lords Lee lived in a house which still survives called Stonely Abbey in Warwickshire. It's an enormous Baroque palace. So there was, and Jane Austen, with her mother, went and stayed there. So she'd been in this very um, rather spectacularly grand house. Uh, the ancestry on this side uh, included um, Jane's great great uncle. <coughs> the Duke of Chandos, who was one of the grandest aristocrats in the entire country. So uh, although Jane's immediate family background was straightened, I mean, the Austins were short of money, um, it was a bit of a struggle. But nonetheless, you know, it, within her family, um, there was um, aristocracy, both barons and even a duke. And there is a third peerage uh, in her connection, too, on that side. And that, I think, makes it striking that lords are effectively absent from the, the six novels. Um, she could have made, easily made Mr. Darcy a lord. He seems grand enough to be a lord, Mr. Darcy in Pride and Prejudice. Uh, but he isn't. He's, he's, he's is the grandson of a lord. His, mother's the daughter of an earl. Uh, Lady Catherine de Berg is the sister of an earl. Um, Colonel Fitzwilliam, a minor character, uh, is the younger son of an earl and accurately observing the social reality. Um, Colonel Fitzwilliam is made to say as a younger son he can't choose who he marries. He needs to marry an heiress. He needs to marry someone with money because as a younger son he won't have any money himself. So the peerage, lords, are just sort of off stage but present uh, in, uh, in um, Bride and Prejudice. Uh, in the other novels they're really um, not present at all, I think. Uh, in the f uncompleted fragment, The Watsons, there is a young lord. Um, we don't know uh, whether um, Jane Austen would have kept him as a lord if she'd gone on to develop the story, whether he might have taken him down a peg. Um, 
there are two, a couple of baronets uh, in, in her novels. A, a baronet is someone who has, is not a lord, has the hereditary title Sir. So there's Sir Walter Elliot uh, in uh, Persuasion, who is treated as a fool. Um, and um, in, again, the, the unfinished fragment, um, Sanditon, there is a, a, another foolish baronet called Sir Edward uh, Denham. There's the am amiable baronet um, Sir John Middleton in uh, uh, Sense and sens Sensibility. But, but the peerage, the nobility, uh, are more or less uh, kept out. So th there is, I think, a sort of deliberate refusal to trade in the sort of snob values which are so much a part of so many sort of rom ro romantic novels. Um, she just, as it were, isn't interested in having her readers get involved in that sort of um, glamour. Um, I remember reading once Introduction to uh, Pride and Prejudice, uh, which began by saying that Pride and Prejudice um, provided fairy tale satisfactions. And I don't you know, I don't think that's quite right, because the story of Pride and Prejudice is that if someone is pretty and witty and lively, she will marry well. If someone is really beautiful, the, the other sister, Jane, you know, she will marry uh, well. Uh, and that's not a fairy tale. That's, that's life. That's the way things are, which she, I think, as it were, ac accurately observes. So. There is, I think, this, this, this r refusal to trade in snob values, but what um, are her own values? I think this, too, can be misunderstood. Um, in the earlier session, there was uh, a reference to Marilyn Butler, who wrote a very influential book uh, called Jane Austen and the War of Ideas. And the central argument of that book is that there is a war of ideas on. Well, that's true. And Jane Austen was um, in, engaged in it. Uh, she's engaged on the Tory side of this debate. And the, 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 what these books are advocating is this particular um, outlook, I suppose, if you're talking about romantics and rebels and reactionaries, she is being cast as one of the reactionaries. I believe this argument to be entirely wrong. Let us just think about the kind of society represented in one or two of her novels. Now, in some of her novels, I think she's really not interested in representing a society at all. Pride and Prejudice is a book which is a very brilliant comedy, so it is all foreground, so the sort of background, the s social solidity um, behind these um, characters is, is, is not really very present. For example, we don't, the, the village in which the Bennets live you know, <coughs> must have a priest, there must be a parson, but we never hear about him. Um, and it's not clear who owns the land. We only discover actually very late in the book, just by chance, that uh, Mr. Bennet owns quite a bit of the land around there, just because of the plot at that point um, re requires him to have some land so that um, the young men can go and shoot on it. Um, but others of her books, she is more interested in this kind of social depth. And I mean, was the obvious case, I suppose, is, uh, is Emma, which does seem to show, in a sense, the whole society um, of what's either a large village or a small town, Hartfield. And some people as well have seen this as her presenting the example the example of what a good society will be. Well, I, say, I have to say, I don't believe that. It is true that Mr. Knightley, um, the principal landowner of this place, is a, is, is a good landowner. Um, uh, unlike Mr. Bennett in Pride and Prejudice, he is acti active um, in managing and working the land that he owns and looking after the tenant farmers. Whereas Mr. Bennett in Pride and Prejudice seems to do nothing at all. But the, um, the other principal landowner in the place is the heroine's mother, Mr. Woodhouse, and he is lazy, selfish, and a feat. And what about um, the spiritual welfare of the place? It's in the hands of the parson, Mr. Elton, 
uh, who is who is a mean-spirited creep. Uh, I don't know, and he he is the priest. Is this meant to be a good society? And what about Miss Bates, the unmarried daughter of the previous priest? Well, she is on the verge of poverty uh, and, according to Mr. Knightley, is likely to sink deeper uh, into poverty as the years pass by. Now, is this Jane Austen's representation of society as it ought to be? I don't think it can be. Um, she isn't, in my view, um, engaged in ideology at all. Um, she's not well, one of those authors like Dante who tells us what to think. She's more like one of those authors like Shakespeare or Sophocles who presents and leaves us to do the thinking. Um, and so I would say a similar thing about um, Mansfield Park, um, a very great novel. Uh, this is called the novel is actually named after a house. So it is Northanger Abbey, but she left that without a title, um, and that title was given to it by somebody else. Now, whether she would have chosen to call it Northanger Abbey or not, um, I don't know. Um, uh, but Mansfield Park is certainly her own choice. So an actual place, a house, uh, is a central theme of the book. And some people, as they have thought that, again, it's her e example of a good society, a good state of being, that it represents a sort of good order. Um, Lionel Trilling, the famous American critic, described Mansfield Park as the great good place. And on this account, we contrast this orderly society with what happens when Fanny Price goes back to her, um, her own true parents in Portsmouth and they're poor and the house is overcrowded and the mother is slatternly and the whole place is a mess. And uh, what a relief when we go back to Mansfield Park and see the good reality. Well, that is a view that is put forward by highly intelligent people. Again, I think it is completely wrong. Um, it isn't a kind of... It, Mansfield Park isn't a Tory paradise. It's a place that's repressed. It's, it, this is a book. But others of her books, she is more interested in this kind of social depth. And I mean, it was the obvious case, I suppose, is, uh, is Emma, which does seem to show, in a sense, the whole society um, of what's either a large village or a small town, Hartfield. And some people as well have seen this as her presenting the, exam the example of what a good society will be. Well, I, say, I have to say I don't believe that. It is true that Mr Knightley, um, the principal landowner of this place, is a, is, is a good landowner. Um, uh, unlike Mr Bennett in Pride and Prejudice, he is acti active um, in managing and working the land that he owns. And, looking after the tenant farmers, whereas Mr. Bennett and Pride and Prejudice seems to do nothing at all. But the, um, the other principal landowner in the place is the heroine's mother, Mr. Woodhouse, and he is lazy, selfish, and a feat. And what about um, the spiritual welfare of the place? It's in the hands of the parson, Mr. Elton, uh, who is who is a mean-spirited creep, uh, I don't know, and he, he is the priest. Is this meant to be a good society? And what about Miss Bates, the unmarried daughter of the previous priest? Well, she is on the verge of poverty uh, and, according to Mr. Knightley, is likely to sink deeper uh, into poverty as the years pass by. Now, is this Jane Austen's representation of society as it ought to be? I don't think it can be. Um, she isn't, in my view, um, engaged in ideology at all. Um, she's 
not well, one of those authors like Dante, who tells us what to think. She's more like one of those authors like Shakespeare or Sophocles, who presents and leaves us to do the thinking. Um, and so, I would say a similar thing about um, Mansfield Park, um, a very great novel. Uh, this is called, the novel is actually named after a house. So it is Northanger Abbey, but she left that without a title, um, and that title was given to it by somebody else. Now, whether she would have chosen to call it Northanger Abbey or not, um, I don't know. Um, uh, but Mansfield Park is certainly her own choice. So an actual place, a house, uh, is a central theme of the book. And some people, as they have thought that, again, it's her e example of a good society, a good state of being, that it represents a sort of good order. Um, Lionel Trilling, a very famous American critic, described Mansfield Park as the great good place. And on this account, we contrast this orderly society with what happens when Fanny Price goes back to her, um, her own true parents in Portsmouth and they're poor and the house is overcrowded and the mother is slatternly and the whole place is a mess. And uh, what a relief when we go back to Mansfield Park and see the good reality. Well, that is a view that is put forward by highly intelligent people. Again, I think it is completely wrong. Um, it isn't a kind of... It, Mansfield Park isn't a Tory paradise. It's a place that's repressed. It's, it, this is unlike any of her other novels, which comes close to being tragic. And that um, Ma Ma Mansfield... That Thomas Bertram, who uh, owns the place, um, is virtuous, but he is stuffy. Um, the young people in the place are repressed. Um, everything goes wrong. Uh, it goes wrong, but because the place is, is repressed, Sir Thomas Bertram is dull and stuffy. Uh, his wife, Lady Bertram, oh, that's another baronet I've forgotten about, Sir Thomas Bertram, uh, uh, it, you know, is torpid. Uh, and it's, it's terribly poignant that Fanny can't really cope with her real parents because it's all a, a, a mess. And she knows she ought to be able to. Um, and it's a kind of defeat uh, when she finds a kind of comfort in going back to the dullness uh, of Mansfield Park. <coughs> a last final thought, with which I, I will leave since I'm on uh, Mansfield Park. If you're looking for feminism uh, or romanticism in Jane Austen, this, in my view, is, is the book to go to for two reasons. Uh, one, there's the speech which Fanny, little timid mousy Fanny, uh, <coughs> surprisingly makes when everyone is telling her that she, she must marry Henry Crawford. Um, and you know, she won't because she loves somebody else. And she bursts out suddenly in this speech saying, you know, why um, should it be, be expected that a, a woman should marry a man just because he's A, rich, and B has chosen, um, t t decided to marry her. She just won't. It's the most defiantly feminist statement in any of her novels. And secondly, because this timid, mousy, uninteresting, peculiar heroine has the most romantic imagination. She's reading a book in China, and a marvellous piece of... Jane Austen invents symbolism in this book, you know. And in... In, in the East Room, which is the room which, which she inhabits, she's sort of imprisoned in this room. But on the other hand, there are, there are transparencies on the window. And the transparencies represent a ruined Gothic abbey, Tintern Abbey, some mountains in the Lake District, a cave in Italy. So as she looks out of the window at the park outside, which is really the limits of her world, she's also looking at distant romance. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. And now I would like to present Professor Fiona Stafford.
Uh, she's currently professor of English at University of Oxford. She graduated with first class honors and has a BA in English, Masters of Philosophy in English Romantic Studies at Oxford University, and is Doctor of Philosophy with a published thesis, The Sublime Savage, James McPherson and the Poems of Ossian. She has been a lecturer in several universities, including the University of Evansville, Lincoln College in Oxford, the University of Northampton, St. Anne's College in Oxford, and Somerville College in Oxford. She is Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Honorary Fellow of the Robert Burns Centre in Glasgow. She has published several books, including Starting Lines in Scottish, English, and Irish Poetry, Brief Lives, Jane Austen, Local Attachments, winner of the British Academy Rosemary Crosshai Prize. She has edited also several books, some of those, Jane Austen's Emma and Pride and Prejudice, and has also published numerous articles, book chapters, and reviews. Can everyone hear that all right? Yeah, good. Um, well, it's very nice to be here, and I'm very delighted to have been invited. Um, I was invited to talk about all of Jane Austen's novels, but that will be a very, very long, <laughs> long morning. So um, I'm just going to talk about some aspects of, of her novels, um, things that I think are very important in the development of the, of the English novel. So I'll make some specific references to particular texts, uh, but I'm very happy to talk about any of them um, if you want to ask questions afterwards. Um, it's, it's, um, it's very helpful to have had uh, Richard Jenkins talking about Austen's family, um, because I think one of the things that's very important to her later style is that she grew up in a household um, where girls were allowed to read. Um, and at this time, this was quite unusual, uh, in lots of um, English households of that sort of class, um, novel reading was banned because it was thought to be a bit dangerous for young women. But actually, um, Jane Austen's uh, family were great novel readers. There's a letter where she talks about being a family of great novel readers and not ashamed to be so. Um, and when a circulating library opened up in the local village, um, her mother subscribed so that Jane and Cassandra could read whatever they wanted. And this is very unusual. Um, and I think, um, I don't know whether any of you are familiar with her early writings, but she started writing very early um, as a teenager. She was writing quite extraordinary pieces of work. They weren't published at the time, but now we're fortunate enough to be able to, to read them in modern editions. And what we see um, in this early writing is an extraordinary kind of natural literary understanding. She's writing parodies of um, modern histories of England, this kind of thing. She's writing little plays. She writes a little miniature novel, which is um, just takes a, a heroine through one day. Um, and we think of the sort of novel in a day very much as sort of modernist 20th century thing. But there's Jane Austen as a teenager doing this as a little, as a little parody. And she used to give these pieces of writing uh, to friends and family. So writing for her um, is obviously a, a very sort of early passion, but also um, it's a form of conversation. It's a kind of gift. And I think because she grew up in a household with lots of very articulate Oxford-educated elder brothers, she needed ways of attracting a bit of attention, um, getting her voice heard. And it was very quickly obvious that she was probably the cleverest of all of them, in spite of being the little sister. And I think that gave her a kind of confidence um, and um, we can see her starting to write really quite seriously by the time she's entering her 20s. Um, she's born in 1775, and the first version of Pride and Prejudice uh, was actually finished by 1797. So by the time she's 21, she's got a complete novel. She'd already written um, Lady Susan, which is a novel in letters. Um, she'd written a version of Sense and Sensibility at that stage. So an extraordinary early talent. Um, and, and that's another thing we might think about with romanticism. Uh, we were hearing about different kinds of romanticism this morning um, and thinking about that, that very sort of early genius um, that, that sort of flowers and then burns out. We don't usually think of Jane Austen in that way. We tend to think of people like John Keats or Thomas Chatterton. 
But there is Jane Austen, um, already writing brilliant stuff by the time she's in her 20s. Um, but she didn't, she didn't publish it. Um, she tried. Her father actually sent a version of Pride and Prejudice uh, to a publisher, um, but it was turned down. He didn't even read it. He just sent it back. A big mistake. Um, <laughs> but then she tried again, um, and the version of what became Northanger Abbey, she actually sold to a publisher um, in 1803 as Lady Susan. But it was never published. So she had <coughs> these, uh, these real kind of setbacks, I think, at a <coughs> formative stage. And um, then she stopped writing for a bit, or she stopped trying to publish things. Um, and then when she moved um, to Chawton Cottage um, in 1809, um, she was finally able to do that. And she moved there with her mother and sister. She had a kind of a place to be. Um, she'd spent a few years traveling around um, because her father died. Um, the, the women of the family were then uh, in very sort of reduced circumstances. I think what Richard was saying about class being uh, unstable for Jane Austen is, is very true. After her father died, their income was, was reduced. So she, she'd been dependent on her brothers. And finally, the richest brother found them somewhere to live. So she and her sister and her mother moved into this house. And then she got out these old manuscripts. She started writing again. Um, and she published Sense and Sensibility. It was a big success. Uh, so she went back into the drawer to find the manuscript of, of Pride and Prejudice, worked that up published that huge success um, and then with that sort of confidence she then starts writing her mature novels Mansfield Park, Emma, Persuasion follow very quickly um, but then of course um, she, she becomes ill and dies at the height of her powers so it's a very sort of tragic um, biography really and astonishing that she should have published such important novels in such a, a, a short space of time. But I think it's interesting when we read a novel like Pride and Prejudice um, to see this is an older woman um, going back to her younger, her younger work. And you can see the sort of energy of the original version there, I think, when she was 21, um, very much influenced by uh, 18th century uh, style still. It's, it's interesting, this morning we were hearing about the novel, novels of Samuel Richardson, a uh, major 18th century novelist, and his novels were all in letter form. Um, and, it's, uh, and one of Jane Austen's unpublished novels, Lady Susan, takes the form of letters. It's possible that when she first wrote Sense and Sensibility, that was written uh, largely in letters as an epistolary novel. Um, and you can see um, this influence uh, in the novels she publishes. They're not letter fiction, but they use letters in very interesting ways. If, you, um, if you're familiar with Sense and Sensibility, um, you'll remember the very dramatic scene where um, Marianne um, has um, realised that, that Willoughby is, is, no longer <laughs> is no longer interested in her or is not going to marry her. Um, and there's a very dramatic scene where she's lying on the bed surrounded by letters. So letters become a really sort of important physical object um, in Austen's letters. And we actually at last see one of Willoughby's letters and it's there on the page and it's, it's a huge shock. And I think it's much more of a shock because the whole novel isn't in letters. I think if the whole book had been written in a series of letters, that, that particular letter wouldn't have had the impact it has. But because we've been dying to see these letters, we've heard about Marianne and Willoughby having this secret correspondence, um, which was uh, very risque at that time. And as readers, we're very interested to know what they're saying to each other. And Eleanor is very interested to know what they're saying to each other. And then we suddenly see this letter and it's not what we're expecting at all because it's this terrible, cold rejection. So it has this enormous shock value. And I think Austen's very, very clever with her use of letters in, in all her fiction. In nearly all the novels, letters are quite important. Um, in Pride and Prejudice, um, it's when Elizabeth reads Mr. Darcy's letter. If you remember when his, his, his first proposal is rejected, um, and then the next day, he gives her this very long letter, um, which we have reproduced on the page. And then the whole of the next chapter um, is Elizabeth reading and rereading this letter. So as readers, we can actually go through this as well. We can go back to the letter, read it again. Um, so she uses letters in really interesting ways um, to, to deliver shocks. It's very important at the end of Persuasion, in her last complete novel, um, Captain Wentworth's letter to Anne Elliot causes this enormous emotional revolution right at the end of, of the book. So she, she's using these devices from the 18th century, but she's using other things as well. Um, and, and the thing is, um, 
she doesn't just, I think, draw on Richardson. She's also drawing on uh, writers like Henry Fielding or the playwright Sheridan, um, who, whose work she knew very well. She performed in a in a production or for it obviously private production um, of, of the rival. She knows the uh, dramatists very well, and I think you can see that as well in her um, use of dialogue within the letters. I mean, that's one of the things I think that's very striking about Pride and Prejudice, this brilliant conversation that goes on. She's very, very good at witty dialogue, and that's obviously a dramatic technique uh, rather than an epistolary one. I think in, in, a, in letter fiction, it's very difficult to do dialogue because there's something very stagey about it. You know, if you're writing a letter, you're not usually dramatising a conversation. There's something sort of artificial and awkward about that. So, so Jane Austen develops this absolutely brilliant narrative technique that's so flexible that she can use dramatic you know, the, the techniques from drama, but also um, use letter fiction as well. Um, but of course, what she also does, and I think what she's most famous for, perhaps, um, she develops what's come to be known as free indirect discourse. Um, which means that as a reader, you suddenly find yourself in the head of the heroine, but you're not quite sure how you got there. It's a very sort of clever technique, and she uses it especially in her later novels. It's something she really develops in Emma most, I think. Um, and she used again in, in Persuasion, um, where you will be seeing the um, heroine perhaps from the outside, um, assuming we're a sort of omniscient narrator or uh, people just sort of watching what's happening. And then suddenly um, you're in her head. I'll, I'll just read you a tiny little bit from Emma where you see this technique. I think this is one of the best short examples. Um, this is the moment um, in Emma where <laughs> Emma realises that her great sort of matchmaking plan for Harriet and Mr Elton hasn't gone quite <laughs> according to plan. Um, and so she's reflecting on this. And there's this brilliant scene, which is very sort of typical of the whole novel, which is very much a, hero a single heroine-centred novel. Um, and it starts like this. The hair was curled and the maid sent away. And Emma sat down to think and be miserable. It was a wretched business indeed. Such an overthrow of everything she had been wishing for. Such a development of everything most unwelcome. Such a blow for Harriet. That was the worst of all. And you can see in that little passage the way we slip from looking at Emma. The hair was curled, the maid was sent away, Emma sat down and then suddenly oh, it was a wretched business. This is Emma talking to herself effectively. Um, and it's such a sort of deft... Um, deft technique and she uses such sort of simple language that even today 200 years later we respond to that I think very very immediately and we don't realize just what a skillful writer she is and how she's developing these techniques for the first time and of course all the novelists who follow in the 19th century we tend to think of the 19th century is the great period of, of the English novel, um, George Eliot, Dickens, everybody. Um, they're all kind of influenced by Jane Austen. So I think if we're thinking about her cultural legacy, um, then actually just her, her, her technique, her absolute brilliant style, um, is, a, is a really important aspect of it. Um, um, now, I, I would talk a little bit about the themes, but I, I don't want to talk for, for too long. I don't know how, how I'm doing for time. I can talk a little bit about... Three minutes. Oh, well, in that case, I won't talk. About, I won't talk about the things. I talked about her, her style uh, and the cultural legacy, but I think um, to to add to what Richard has said and what's been said this morning, um, other aspects that she brings to the novel um, are things like. Um, treating female experience very seriously. And I think that's something we just cannot underestimate, actually. Again, something we're very familiar now, we almost take it for granted. Um, but the way in which she is taking young women and looking at their experience, and also older women as well. I mean, Mrs. Bennet, um, I have quite a, a soft spot for, actually. She, she is sort of held up as a figure of ridicule. But I think as you reflect on the novel and you think about the situation she's in, she's produced um, five daughters in very quick succession, um, and anyone who's ever given birth to one child will know that that's you know, no mean feat in itself. Um, but she's then in this situation where, because she hasn't produced a son, um, 
if anything happens to Mr Bennett, she and all her five daughters are going to be evicted. They're going to be dispossessed. So it's actually not surprising that she's quite anxious and also um, quite keen to find some husbands. I mean, she is a very kind of comical figure and Jane Austen's genius is that she, she doesn't sentimentalise this at all. She shows Mrs Bennett as a very comical, very embarrassing mother. And yet she also shows us why Mrs. Bennett is, is how she is and what, what exactly what a difficult situation it is to contend with and especially as there are not that many suitable eligible men um, and with all of these daughters so close together it's a, it's a, real, it's a real problem and when Mr. Collins arrives um, it will, this sort of situation is brought home very much to us and of course if we think about Sense and Sensibility which is the novel she finished just before Pride and Prejudice the opening situation what gets the plot going really um, is the death of the husband and and the mother and the daughters having to move out. They're, they're just kicked out of the house. And that's the threat that's hanging over Mrs. Bennett all the way through Pride and Prejudice. Um, so I'll just leave you with that thought. <laughs> Thank you. Um, finally, I'd like to present uh, Professor Angeles de la Concha. She's Professor of English Philology at UNED University teaching medieval and renaissance English literature and contemporary English literature. She's co-author co of the volumes Exes of Medieval and Renaissance English Literature and English Literature in the Second Half of the 20th Century. She's a specialist in English Literature, Theory and Critique, and Gender Studies, fields where she has particularly studied, studied in ideology and narrative techniques, the social construction of subjectivity, feminist writing, literature and history and rewritings of canonical texts. In the area of genders, of gender studies, she has directed the research projects Maternal Role in Cultural Discourses and Social Organization, the result of which was the volume Women and Children First, Discourses of Motherhood, and Literature and Gender Violence, the Representation of Violence and the Violence of Representation, which results were published in the volume The Cultural Substrate of Gender Violence, Literature, Art, Movies and Video Games under her co coordination. She has published numerous art articles on English female writers such as Jane Austen, George Eliot, Virginia Woolf, Doris Letts Lessing, eh, among others, particularly related with issues on literature and history, trauma and ethics, and cultural and gender studies, mainly on the influence of literature in shaping the identity and female desire. Well, thank you very much, um, first of all, for the, the invitation and for having the opportunity of sharing with all of you um, views on such an interesting and nowadays terrifically popular author, uh, Jane, Jane Austen. I'm sorry that we have to race along, <laughs> so I'll try to give a very quick, um, a very quick review of the um, of her um, of the impact of Jane Austen in. Um, in contemporary novels, rewritings of her novels and contemporary film remakes also of her works. I think it is really amazing considering that she herself looked at herself as working on a little piece of ivory. So she herself would be amazed at all this, you know, production um, of uh, this really numberless uh, films and uh, works and novels and remakes and sequels and every possible kind of, of literature on her and on her work. If I can open this. So I think that the, mm, well, I've given here a, a sort of patchwork of mm. the, the most, the, the most well-known um, films and rewritings of her work. But I think that the first sign of Austen's popularity is her portrait on the 10 pounds note, which is quite fitting really, because as we have heard, uh, she, was very, uh, she was very sensitive to questions of money, of property, because she realized what difficult conditions women mm, had to live and what was the future of women who weren't beautiful enough clever enough, rich enough to, um, to marry well. And uh, from her own experience, of which <coughs> as we have learned here, I mean, she was sensitive to all these issues. 
Well, as I've said, another sign of her popularity today is the films, is the many films on, uh, there are two films on her own life. The first one, Becoming Jane, which is based on the biography Becoming Jane Austen by John Hunter Spence, which focuses on Jane Austen's early life, her development as author and her real life short romance with a law student, Tom Lefroy, who many speculate was the model for Mr. Darcy. The film is interesting because it's in this style of Shakespearean love, which uh, you may have seen or you, may you might know of. And, um, and in it mixes really um, actual is historical facts with, uh, with events of her fiction, so and of her works. So mm, it's interesting, but of course it's highly imaginative. The other film, Miss Austin Regrets, is a BBC film based on the novelist last years and which looks back to the looks back to the reason why she never married, which in, as you know, it's interesting too because her novels focus around marriage, around the right uh, option, the choosing the right, uh, the right partner. Um, as I've told you, there are numberless uh, films on her works and mm, so many that I'm, I've chosen uh, Pride and Prejudice as Paradigm because of course I, I couldn't give even a, a, a quick view of, uh, of, uh, of the whole of uh, these um, productions. Uh, only of this novel there have been made six films until two hundred and the most perhaps the most interesting is the one uh, released in 2005 and there are also five television uh, versions produced by the BBC just to just for you to get an idea of the number of, uh, of uh, films on, you know, w focusing on just one novel. Uh, this, the, the BBC version, in fact, was became so very popular that Colin Firth, who was at the moment quite, quite angno, became famous, and especially because of a short, you know, scene there where he comes out of, uh, he takes um, a plunge in a pond and comes out and sort of bumps into uh, Elizabeth, who is visiting Pemberley. Uh, so much so, uh, the film became so popular that it mm, gave way to this, uh, to a sort of Austen mania, or rather Dur Darcy mania, because Darcy <laughs> is really a lesser, uh, a lesser character in the novel, but because of Colin Firth, because of his being so very attractive, and because of that, it raised, you know, a number of, uh, uh, well, it, it, and, and what is more important, an um, interesting um, intertextual play with other films and with other novels. Um, The, 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 oh well, that's a more or less, you know, faithful version of the work. But now we have the contemporary adaptations of that work. And we have the first one here, the most famous, and I'm quite sure the most of you have watched the film, Bridget Jones' Diary, which was released in 2001, a romantic comedy based on Helen Fielding's novel of the same title, and which borrows the basic you know, plot elements from Pride and Prejudice and little else. <laughs> the female protagonist, for instance, works at Pemberley Publishing and is drawn to a haughty barrister named Darcy, played once again by Colin Firth. So you have this intertextual play with the other films. Both the novel and the film deal with the predicament of young professional women who are nevertheless as emotionally dependent as prone to make social mistakes and to suffer the same misunderstandings as Jane Austen heroines. In the first film, uh, Bridget Jones' Diary was comic and was funny and was fresh. I'm afraid the second is simply awful, <laughs> with the protagonist <laughs> perpetually making a fool of herself. And the worst part of it is that we are threatened of a th with a third version. <laughs> so it's a question of debate for, you know, later, um, why, why uh, 
Jane popular has become pop uh, Jane Austen has become popular in this way. What has been made of her work, and why does it appeal to mm, to so many to so many people to such a large uh, audience? I'm quite sure that it's perhaps because it, these are products of um, um, mass culture, uh, postmodern culture in the worst possible sense of the of the term and uh, post-feminist uh, stage too, and I say that with regret. A film which is interesting is uh, Bride and Prejudice, which is a Bollywood musical film, a brilliant example of Indian film industry. It is a Bollywood style update of Jane Austen's uh, novel in which, in which um, a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Barshki are eager to find suitable husbands for their four married daughters. And, but it is a cross-cultural experiment full of fun. So if you're interested in, in knowing a little bit of this Indian, the huge uh, Indian film industry is a wonderful example. A large number of these remakes cater to young women or girls in their teens. So we have lost in Austin, left, top left, which is an irreverent miniseries in which a Darcy obsessive young woman, woman swaps places with Lizzie Bennet, who wants to live in present day London, and meanwhile she tries to fit in Pemberley. Again, it, it plays intertextually with the previous remakes, and in fact she urges her Mr. Darcy to plunge in a lake, Colin Firth style, <laughs> so that she can uh, enjoy a quote, a postmodern mom moment. You have also the Lizzie mm, Bennett Diaries, uh, down left, uh, which is an American drama web TV series where the story is conveyed in the form of vlogs, that is, blocks with video, and in which uh, Elizabeth Bennett is turned into a video blogger. She's a mass communications communications grad student, still living at home with her parents and her two sisters, sweet Jane and rebellious party loving Lydia. And with the help of her friend Charlotte Lou, she starts a vlog series for his thesis, for his thesis discussing trivialities of every day of her everyday life. And this, this series makes a very clever use of um, transmedia elements such as off a uh, web series and other social media. It's interesting because it's a representation of, um, of uh, fashionable. Now, um, I wonder whether you have heard of fan fiction, which is to take uh, a protagonist of one of the novels you really like and then write a sequel or write uh, a story for her or himself. We have also Clueless, which is loosely based on on Emma. Um, Emma, I haven't I haven't had the opportunity to to see to watch it, but uh, I mean you, you might get an idea of the funny situations taken to contemporary life and the predicament of young girls and uh, all. Well, the, the interesting uh, the interest of these films as well as of the novels that we are going to mention is, I think that more that in the in themselves is because of the dialogue they establish with uh, Jane Austen's work. You are looking for hints, you are trying to discover what is, uh, what appears in Jane Austen, how it has been changed, what are, you know, what are the interesting uh, points of, um, in which they, they are similar and in which they differ. Now, mm, at this point, uh, we may of course wonder what is the reason for this popularity and ask ourselves about Jane Austen's real relevant impact. Emma Thompson, who wrote the screenplay uh, for and starred in Sense and Sensibility, set an, and won um, uh, the, the Oscar for the script, said that some um, women still fall in love with the wrong guy, girls are still jilted, and of course, women want to marry. We could add, of course, that many women still hope to find the rich, handsome hero who will chose them, discover, so to speak, their value, and by the mere fact of being cho the chosen one, uh, become unique. 
Of course, there are various other reasons for the present-day popularity of Jane Austen's work in general, besides this, you know, sort of um, more trivial or, or really important um, issues. In the first, in the first uh, place, she's a canonical writer whose works are subject to a re uh, are a subject matter of research and are studied for all kinds of serious reasons. As a master of social observation, as we have been told, of character development and growth, um, we study her for her comic spirit and wit, for her indirect kind of dialogue, for the situation of women at her time, for issues of money and class, which uh, all of, of these reasons explain why her six novels are endlessly reprinted with detailed introductions which vary, you know, vary their focus according to the different critical theories. The reason for the success in film of film adaptations of the more literary kind as this one for instance is that her novels offer the possibility to cater to an audience yearning to enter a beautiful last world. They are nostalgic for this a dream world and all filmmakers of Austen's books have resorted to uh, beautiful costumes, sceneries, um, interior design, beautifully in beautiful interior design rooms and especially new technologies have now made these films exciting enough to compete you know with ordinary movie and TV viewers and at, and at the same time they allow them to um, sort of identify with very attractive characters with high profile you know um, male and female characters and in that way by identifying with them they are they are able to go through the catharsis and through the development and to the growth and to the warnings that Jane Austen makes. Um, the films, I think, that are certainly more popular with, uh, with women, and I think because I think that they uh, do reflect and do, do represent very well the situation of women, sometimes not this not only these literary ones, but sometimes the more the remakes, the contemporary remakes, um, exploring the predicaments of women nowadays, which apparently, um, which though they represent um, heroines who apparently are more independent, are professional women, are you know bright, intelligent women, they they really suffer the same limitations or are subject to the to problems which are not very different from the heroines of um, Austen's time. Um, these films risk, in a way, these literary films, when they are so very attractive and when they rely on the appeal of these um, actors and actresses, uh, risk changing the discourse of Jane's, Jane Austen's novels. So in this case, for instance, uh, for those of you, of you who have had the opportunity of seeing the, the film, uh, Colonel Bland Brandon is an absolutely different mm, character from the one in Austen's novel. He's attractive, he's appealing, so instead of, uh, they, so instead of being a cautionary tale as Jane Austen, uh, imagine uh, him, uh, his and uh, his marriage, to um, to Marian or Marian married to him, um, he's so attractive that passion is, you know, allied with love instead of um, um, having a sort of criticism or cautionary tale about romance and um, unchecked um, emotion and sensibility. At the same time, uh, Austen showed how the laws of the t at, the, uh, at the time deprived women of any real choice or any real power in life. And the danger with these films is that the contemporary viewer can think that laws have been changed and so women have uh, various other options. Well, in fact, 
custom and mores go on being responsible for keeping women financially and therefore emotionally vulnerable to, uh, to men. Finally, I'd like to point out uh, another substantial reason, which is that her works, particularly those catering to, um, the, to more youthful female audiences, are adapted, as I mentioned before, to, um, to a postmodern consumerist world, commercial world, and a post-feminist uh, culture. If we turn now to the novels, uh, mm, if you go to Wikipedia, Wikipedia, for instance, you will find there a list of no less than 76 writers who have written one or several literary adaptations only, only of Pride and Prejudice. So, I mean, this can make give you a clear idea of um, the number of <laughs> of remakes and or sequels uh, and of sequels that have been made. Just uh, you know, limiting myself to Pride and Prejudice, I have chosen uh, just a <laughs> few a few <laughs> a few examples so that you may uh, you may have an idea of the variety and of the incredible you know different approaches to the novel. Uh, you have their Pride and Prejudice and Zombies starting quite predictably with the most famous novel opening sentence. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a zombie in possession of brains must be in want of more brains. And from <laughs> that sentence moves on to a mayhem of romance, sword fights, cannibalism and thousands of rotting corpses. You have also, well, th that's, uh, that's an experiment, and then we have really a gem, I think, which is Death Comes to Pemberley by P.D. James, who, well, the novel is altogether different, of course. P.D. James is a wonderful and very literary mystery and crime writer, and she masterfully recreates uh, the world of Pride and Prejudice, filling it with the excitement and suspense of a brilliant crime story when the peaceful and orderly world of Permely is suddenly shaken because Wickham has been murdered. So we have a remake of the novel in a different, um, in a different genre, that of the detective story. Um, we have now, in, I have chosen now Emma Tennant, Emma Tennant's rewritings of uh, three of novel, uh, three of Austen's novels, um, Pride and Prejudice, um, Sense and Sensibility, and Emma. What is interesting of um, Emma Tennant is that she opens, she goes to, she questions the, the convention of the realist novel of the poetic justice, which presided the closure of the novels and which was course everything but realistic and then she opens she opens the novels there and goes beyond the marriage and sees what happens next what happens when life goes on characters have indeed changed but not enough and so we have the same conflicts and mm, she makes uh, for instance in the first one in an unequal marriage she makes Elizabeth and Darcy suffer the same, the same problem uh, the family of Elizabeth suffered, which is interesting because as we have been told, I mean, makes the character of Mrs. Bennet less comical and uh, you start to understand her. So, we, uh, so Tennant explores the anxiety, really Darcy, and very especially Elizabeth feels because she doesn't get pregnant, she doesn't produce an heir, and so uh, the Pemberley beautiful state runs the risk of, um, of uh, going to, a to, to another member of the family. Um, in, the, when in the second part, Pemberley revised, we have the problem that uh, Elizabeth effectively has produced an heir, but then the son is not as handsome, as brilliant, as nice, as good as their parents would have wished. And so we have the problem that the one who's clever and smart and intelligent and uh, really, you know, uh, active is her s his sister. 
and he is a problem in itself. So, I mean, these novels, um, and well, and if we turn to uh, Eleanor and Marion, which is the title mm, corresponding to Sense and Sensibility, we, we see what really happens after the marriage. And of course, uh, Colonel Brandon is a boring old man who catches colds all the time, and Marion is as, uh, Marion is as fanciful as, uh, as always, and in fact, she runs away to, um, to uh, mm, uh, a commune of uh, uh, poets, which, by the way, there existed at the time. I think it was the poet Saudi who founded one. So Engma Tennant very cleverly, you know, mixes, uh, opens up the novels and goes to the time and sees what could have happened, sees what is threatening, you know, what is lurking under the, the novels. In themselves, they, well, you can't compare them with Austen's novels, not at all, but they are interesting for the same reason, for this kind of dialogue, and very specially when it is the, the discourse, the ideological discourse, which is subverted and which is examined, and so we can reflect on those issues from a different <coughs> perspective, which makes them interesting. Well, um, as if all these rewritings were not enough, we have now another commercial venture. The HarperCollins Austin project aimed at having six, six best-selling contemporary authors recreating Jane Austen's six uh, complete novels. It was released with the um, with bestseller uh, writer jo Johanna Trollope, a writer uh, we could mm, label as a women's writer, uh, reimagining sense and sensibility. You have the connection there in October uh, 2013. And has continued with, <laughs> um, with the Scottish writer Val McDermott's reworking of Northanger Abbey in spring, uh, in spring this last year, in this very year. Um, she sets the story in the Edinburgh Festival and uh, well, it's interesting because um, because of this, you know, this updating and bringing to our day. I mean, what might have, what might be the similar um, characteristics or the similar su life situations in which contemporary women may find themselves, but giving them, you know, a different a different flair altogether. Finally, well, finally, the third n the third project, the third installment would be. Curtin's Sittenfeld, who's another best-selling author, who's, mm, oh no, no, sorry, I'm sorry, this is Alexander McCall Smith, who's n very well known for his Ladies Detective Agency series, who is now writing a modern adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma, you see there, the film adaptation and the original Emma, so that you can see, you know, the, the, all the, the progress and the successive uh, changes. And then finally, there's another. Th there's Curtin Sittenfeld's *Pride and Prejudice*, *Pride and Prejudice*, who will be, uh, which will be released next autumn, and is interesting because this this writer, this female writer, is a best-selling American author whose novels include *American Wife*, which is a fictionalized biography of the first lady Laura Bush. So you can see, <laughs> you know, the 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 um, well the interesting connections and the interesting uh, rewritings and the various reasons of uh, different kinds that, um, that appeal to us today. I'd, I'd like to know why very often. So perhaps we could ask these questions. What is it that uh, makes this, um, these rewritings so very different from uh, Jane Austen's spirit and um, and uh, well world vision that we are having today. Well, it was very brief, but um, I think it might give you um, an idea of what we are having with all these um, ventures. Thank you.